بسم الله والحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته dear brothers and sisters I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to facilitate everything that we need for our learning over the next couple of days and that it becomes a source of ilm al and that becomes a source of beneficial knowledge to us all and the topic itself is one of those topics which um, that if you don't come out of the end having um, f- feeling any different if you like then it may be uh, a good opportunity for all of us if anyone feels like that to really take account of our own selves because we're not talking about just a theoretical topic which may or may not be applicable to us but we're talking about a topic which is almost well it is talking about how I should be and taking benefits of uh, how to leave this this worldly life how to leave this dunya because we know that none of us will live forever at least in this life we will all die and none of us remember how we came into this earth. None of us remember that. Although it was um, a big moment for us coming into this life. Imagine that you spent nine months in your mother's womb. That was your existence. You don't remember when you came into this earth. I'm sure it's quite tra- quite traumatic for all of us at that particular time because the environment that we were living in to the environment that we're living in now is very different. Likewise, when we leave this dunya and we go into the next life, the surroundings will be very different. But it may be the case that we will feel life leave our bodies. We may feel the soul leave our bodies. Or we may, just like uh, the Prophet informed us, that towards the end of time, that there would be uh, an increase in sudden death. That a person would be just seen as healthy, everything is okay, and then suddenly they they just pass away, they die. So you may not have time to prepare for it. Nonetheless, we are all here now, and it's an opportunity for us to uh, to think about and ponder over how we will leave or how I should pre- prepare myself at least to, to leave this life. So we'll go through a number of topics, inshallah, which will uh, enable us, and I say myself first and foremost, to, to understand this very important topic. The topic is the fiqh of janazah the fiqh of the funeral prayer which in itself is a very mechanical title talking about how do I pray janazah is more than that we'll have to talk about a few more things we'll have to talk about death what is death um, signs of a good death signs of a bad death um, we'll talk about burials shrouding washing the body which we will concentrate on tomorrow when we make a visit to the graveyard, inshallah. Now, <clears throat> our beloved Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, being the best man, best person, best of Allah's creation on this earth, if there was anyone deserving of living forever because of obedience, because of ta'a, because of humbleness, because of taqwa, because of hope and fear in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, if there was anyone deserving of that, it would have been the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. However, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us, كُلُّ نَفْسٍ ذَائِقَةُ الْمَوْتِ That every soul, every soul, without exception, every soul shall taste death. And these topics, at times when I've not experienced death, or I've not seen it very much, even if I have been brought up 
and it has been trivialized. For many of us, it has been trivialized. Death is something trivial. It's not something necessarily to be pondered over <coughs> deeply. It is something to be taken as maybe funny or a joke or not to be taken serious. Maybe we came across, if there were television programs or cartoons or even films, that death isn't taken really that seriously as it should be, at least from an Islamic perspective. So throughout the many years that we have been on this earth, my understanding or the true understanding of death that I have, is it, is it a correct understanding? Am I in the right frame of mind, really? In understanding this particular topic correctly. So our beloved sallallahu alayhi wa sallam passed away and moved on to the next life, next life, which is the life of the barzakh, the life of the grave. And the life of the grave is not a life, not an existence that we compare to this life. Is something completely different and we don't draw parallels it's a very different life now the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam after performing Hajj about three four months later not even that yeah three months later or so that he became very ill he became very sick and his sickness alayhi salam, was something which was quite gradual it's not something that suddenly happened. He was the age of 63, and that he became ill, alayhi salatu wasalam, and that his state over the period of days, and the Sahaba, and it is mentioned in books of, um, of Sunnah, of Ahadith, how the Sahaba, radiallahu anhum, he would say, five days before the Prophet, وسلم, he said this, three days before he died, he, would, he said this. So they documented um, how he sallallahu alayhi wa sallam became more ill and then eventually that he left the, this world which in fact is one of the minor signs of the day of judgment the passing of the prophet alayhi wa sallam now as Aisha radiallahu anha she, rep she reported and Aisha radiallahu anha was very close to the situation in that, that the Prophet Sam had sought permission from his family to reside and stay in the house of Aisha. He was unable to, from one day to the next, to go and visit another of his family, alayhi salatu wasalam. They all agreed and he stayed in the house of Aisha. So she was, uh, radiallahu anha, having a first account of what was happening. And that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasalam, through the last moments, hours or day or two days, that he was coming in and out of consciousness because of the severe fever that he had. And he had next to him um, water, like a water vessel, and whenever he could, that he would take the, the water himself and place it on himself to cool himself down, or to ask one of his family members, or the Sahaba, عنهم, to place the water on him. And on each occasion, wanting to and intending to pray the Jama'ah, to pray with the Muslims. But he was unable to do that, and Abu Bakr radiallahu as you know, led the Muslims in, led the Sahaba in Salah. So Aisha radiallahu anha, in his very final moments, uh, that she narrated that he attempted to, he attempted, alayhi salam, to place water uh, over his face. And that he, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, that he mentioned Allah azza wa <coughs> As she radiallahu narrated, fi kulli heen, that he sallallahu alayhi wa sallam would remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on all occasions. And even in the final moments of his worldly life, that he said, La ilaha illallah, inna lil mawti sakarat, that indeed, that in death, that there is a difficulty. Sakarat is like a state of drunkenness, confusion, very much. And this is for the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. And after repeating this a number of times, La ilaha illallah inna lil mawti sakarat, that he stretched his hand in front of himself. He stretched his hand, and he said, Allahumma ghfirli warhamni. O oh Allah, forgive me and have mercy on me. Wa alhiqri bil rafiq al a'la. And let me join the highest company. 
These were the last words of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wa sallam. Allahumma ghfir li wa arhamni wa alhiqni bir rafiq al-a'la. O oh Allah, forgive me, have mercy on me, and let me join the highest company. And as Aisha radiallahu anha, she narrates that then after saying this, that his hand fell limp, and that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, commanded that the life of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa in this worldly life to be taken. So there is some form of agony in, in death. And this was something that the Prophet ﷺ himself also faced. And that is the, the leaving of the soul from the body. The taking of the soul from the body. Now the topic of the grave, and it's, it's another topic really, and it's not something that we really have a long time to go into. But there is a long hadith of Al-Bara ibn Azib, which I encourage you all to, to read. Which essentially talks about the two souls, the two souls, the believing soul and the disbelieving soul, and how they leave their bodies, and the journey that they both go on, and what they will face. You know in the hadith that it mentions that the believing soul is removed from the believing body, just like when water is poured out of a jug, that it comes out very easily. This is for the believing soul. As for the disbelieving soul, as for the disbelieving soul, then the soul is taken from the body just as like a fork or thorns is passed through cotton and it drags it out and it is a very painful, hence the example, a, pay, a painful experience for that disbelieving soul or even the um, the fajid, the fasiq, the wrongdoer, this may happen to them. Now, having spoken to doctors on different occasions, they have mentioned and they have seen amazing things. They have seen things which that they are unable to explain. And they mention things like that when they, you can see that that person is, by Allah's will, that they are going to die. And that they have given them all possible, as much as you can at least, before it becomes murder. Um, medicines which will take away or attempt to take away the pain so that the person doesn't feel any pain. However, they give them morphine and they give them all other types of painkillers. However, that they know and they can see that the person is going through a very, very difficult situation. And this is a testament and a proof in that what the, the Prophet ﷺ informed us that the disbelieving soul, when their soul is taken slowly, that they will go through agonies and pains of death. And that they have mentioned that, you know, families have asked us, can you not give them any more painkiller? Because they can physically see that they are in agony. And they can't give them anymore because if they give them anymore, then you'd end up killing that person with the morphine, for example. This may not happen to all, you may not see this, but it is evident and it is documented that this does happen. So, <clears throat> death is something that is inevitable for all of us. And you'll find that in the Qur'an and in the Sunnah, it is a topic that it is not hidden. It is not something which is not discussed, but rather let's cross that bridge when we come to it. No, it is something that quite frequently that you find in the Qur'an and likewise in the Sunnah and also in the living example of the Prophet Sallallahu death is not something that was ever hidden or you know, the funeral rites and what happens to the body and so on and so forth it's not something that is <clears throat> you know uh, culturally or religiously you know something that we don't talk about Muslims we talk about death quite often and in fact we know that the Prophet Sallallahu told us to remember death frequently Remember death frequently. And we will go through some evidences, inshallah ta'ala, talking about the benefit of reminding ourselves of death frequently and the impact that it will have on that one individual. Because when you, not only just death, when you look at many things in Islam, when you look at how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala 
teaches us in the Quran. And likewise, the example of the Prophet ﷺ, you'll find that, that there is a particular type of person, and this is a more subtle way of looking at the revelation, as opposed to just looking at an, you know, a practical manner, do's and don'ts, wants, don't wants, whether it's allowed or not. But a little more, that what is it that, or what type of person is it that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants me to be? The commands and the prohibitions will bring about a certain mentality. Now, if you live in a household where your parents are very relaxed with you, don't tell you off, never tell you to do this or to do that, that person will grow up, of course they will have their own personality, but their boundaries might be quite wide and that will bring out a particular type of person. Whereas opposed to another person who may live in a house where there is what well, the boundaries of what you are and what you're not allowed to do are very, very clear that they will have a certain personality. Likewise, in a broader sense, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has told us to do certain things, to be like a certain person. So therefore, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants us to be a, a particular type of person. So a person who is, for example, we take death, a person who is frequently you know, remembering death, it's not how you might say, well, then you're just morbid. That's not, you know, it's not a thing you should be talking about. You should live your life and uh, be happy with what you have with your life because it'll end soon. The point is that as a Muslim, that we, we see this just as a stepping stone. This stage of our lives is just a stepping stone. And it isn't the end. And that remembering death and now enables us to, to not forget that this life is in fact a stepping stone and isn't the end for us. So you find that how they engage with people, um, it will have an impact on them because if I behave and I'm, I'm good to you, and I'll be rewarded for that. And if I'm you know, oppressive to a, towards a person, I'll be accountable for that. So it'll affect the way that you behave with people. So this is something maybe you can ponder over. Again, we don't have a lot of time to, to think about it uh, or discuss this issue in, in any great depth. But it's maybe something you can ponder over, maybe look at how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants us to be psychologically, socially, okay? Uh, it doesn't take away the fact that you can be your own person, of course. So death is something is inevitable, no one can hide from it, no matter how righteous you are. And that it will happen to every single person who comes into this, into this life, in this worldly life. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions in, in, in various places in the Qur'an, there are two places where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that every soul shall taste death. And the first reference is in Surah Ali Imran in verse 185, and the second one in Surah Al-Anbiya, verses 34 and 35. In Surah Ali Imran, the verse actually begins with, كُلُّ نَفْسٍ ذَائِقَةُ الْمَوْتِ That every soul shall taste death. And then the verse continues in the translation that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala informs us that on, only on the day of resurrection will you be given your full compensation. Whoever is removed from the hellfire and admitted to the Jannah shall surely be, or shall surely attain success. And what is this life, or what is the life of this world except the enjoyment of delusion? And the second verse in Surah Al-Anbiya, uh, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, that we have <clears throat> not granted immortality to, to any human being. And that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will ensure that every soul tastes death. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also mentions that there is no escape from it. And wherever you are, like for example in Surah An-Nisa in verse number 78, that wherever you may be that death will overtake you. And even if you are in a strongly elevated fortress. So no one or nothing can stop the inevitable and that is death. If you live a healthy life, you live a healthy life, you will still die. If you live an unhealthy life, you may bring it quicker, but of course you will die as well. There's nothing that you can do to prevent death. So... <clears throat> The fact that we are going to face this death and 
at times you think to yourself, or maybe you should think to yourself, I do think to myself sometimes, that what is it like that if, if you happen to die in a state where maybe you're on a hospital bed or that you are at your home or wherever you may be, but it is a, a death where you, uh, to some extent, and Allah knows best the reality of that, what it is like that is the very beginnings of when your soul is to be taken. So eventually that you will stop breathing. <clears throat> so if you hold your breath, for example, you hold your breath, eventually you will have a reaction that you have to start breathing <coughs> for a number of reasons. Because your body will desire and push you to breathe because it needs oxygen. And then also there's something in your mind that you will start breathing because you have, oh, I don't want to die, so I'll start breathing. So this is something natural within yourself. But then, then there may come, they may, and they will, and Allah knows, that's how it will come, but there may come a time when that you will may want to take another breath, but you can't. You can't take another breath to put more oxygen in, in your body. Because your soul is being taken, and when your soul is being taken, you can put in as much oxygen in your body as you like. But that won't return your soul. So it is these kind of things that when the Prophet ﷺ told us to, to remember death, to remember a death in a way which will have an impact on you, however that may be. In a hadith which is found in Sahih ibn Hibban and Sunan al-Bayhaqi, which are two different books of compilations of hadith, Imam ibn Hibban and Imam al-Bayhaqi. Their books of hadith are very vast, very large. They both recorded a hadith which was narrated by, by two different companions, one of them Anas ibn Malik and the other one Abu Hurairah radiallahu anhu. That <clears throat> as a means of controlling our minds, our desires, the way that we think, this restraining our greed, that the Prophet sallallahu said, that you should frequently remember this, the destroyer of pleasures. And that is what the Prophet sallallahu said to us. Not uzkur al maut kathira, not remember death a lot. He didn't say it like that in this hadith. He sallallahu alayhi wa said, frequently remember the destroyer of pleasures so that the person doesn't become deluded with whatever they have. So remember things which will, or remember that one thing which is going to destroy all of them. That even if a person, you know, they have a palace, they have whatever, they have money, they have fame, and remember that what will end all of them. And the Prophet ﷺ then continued to say that none would remember it while in the, the difficulties or the tightness of living except that it would expand for him or her. And none would remember it while in ease except that it would tighten for him. So when the person is going through, through some difficulties and they remember that, that it would bring some alleviation to them. And if a person is living in ease, it would draw them back in a little bit. So here, it being, brings about the form of hope and fear. Hope and fear. <clears throat> now death, and when you're thinking about death, and when facing death, and having anything to do with death, even if you go to a hospital, which is maybe a stage... I mean, at least we may perceive it to be that way, is the stage, or one of the stages, that a person may take on their path to, to dying. Your, the way that you are inside a hospital, the way that you behave in a hospital, changes. Suddenly you start to whisper. Suddenly you behave in your best behavior. Everything changes when you go into the hospital because you're facing sickness, you're facing difficulty, and you're seeing it. Even when that you, you visit somebody who is very ill, how you behave, you just naturally change. And if you are to go to the graveyard, likewise, how you behave will change as well. So 
So in these times, and when I'm talking about these changes, you find that we are showing weakness within ourselves. The changes that we are experiencing and that we are seeing will bring out some weaknesses in within ourselves because we feel vulnerable. And we are right to feel vulnerable. Because maybe the majority of the time I don't feel vulnerable, I don't feel worried, I don't feel scared. Maybe the majority of the time I don't. But then there may be times when, when I do. And it is at those times is when I need to take stock and take account of, of my life and what's happening. So a number of things I want to mention at these times of, of weaknesses. And I'm talking, I'm, at the moment I'm still within an introductory stage at the moment, okay, if you think where we're going with what I'm talking about. I'm just giving you know, an overall, um, a broad introduction, if you like, into to the, to the topic, the importance of the topic, different approaches to the topic. Okay? And then later on we'll go into some more um, structured learning, because we like structured learning. Okay. So these times of weakness and vulnerability and the fact that the Prophet ﷺ told us to remember the destroyer pleasures what should I do? What kind of things should I remember? I should remember sincerity of worship sincerity of ibadah that whenever I offer my salah I should you know, purify my intention more for salah I should be thankful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for the many things that He has given to me. I should <clears throat> remember that I, as a human being, are created weak. Insan was created very weak. And that you remember your need for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That if you see the sick, that you th you ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to, to cure them. And at the same time that you ask Allah Azza wa to give you health. Because health is a ni'mah. And that you ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to allow you to maybe grow old and live long with good actions. You ask for this. You don't ask for a short life. You don't wish for death. You ask Allah Azza wa for the time that you are living here. To give you whatever long life that you have. And that you should have good actions, sincerity, and that you want to be a true servant to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now we know that a person will get nothing from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala unless that deed is sincerely for Allah azza wa jalla alone. You don't get anything. Now Abu Umama radiallahu anhu reported that a man he came to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And he said, if a man, he goes and he fights jihad fi sabilillah. And also at the same time, he is seeking, you know, some praise from the people. What will he get? The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa but he won't get anything. So the man, he, you know, he asked the question three times. You know, he's fighting fi sabilillah. It's for the sake of Allah, but you know, maybe he wants something from the people as well. The Prophet ﷺ said, La shay, that he'll get nothing. So unless your ibadah, unless your worship is solely, solely, purely for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then you won't receive anything for that. And then the Prophet, and this hadith is found in Sunan al Nasa'i. The Prophet said, Inna Allah la yaqbalu min al amali illa ma kana khalisa. Illa ma kana lahu khalisan. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will not accept any action unless it is done purely for him and that it is done for his face subhanahu wa ta'ala. So we should remember our actions, our sincerity of deeds and at the same time as well as much as we want to purify ourselves and better ourselves at this time, we should also beware and be very careful of doing things which you within yourself or if you think are good. Because at this vulnerable state, at this weak state, 
you may find yourselves and for sure you have seen others do things which you think why are you doing that and where's that coming from for example and we'll mention some of these things later you go to the graveyard and it has an impact on you and then suddenly within yourself you find yourself saying subhanallah 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 la ilaha illallah la ilaha illallah you find yourself you've changed is it from the sunnah to do this now if you want to make dhikr no one's saying you can't make dhikr that's that's a personal thing no problem but because you come to the graveyard because you now feel vulnerable you find yourself let me quickly make some dhikr let me do this and let me do that so you might start then start doing things which maybe are wrong so at times of difficulty you need to be aware at times of vulnerability you need to be aware that you don't fall in you don't do do don't do wrong things things which will dis- displease Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala which is why especially around death funerals Anything to do with that bid'ah is so rife. There's so much bid'ah, innovations into the deen around these areas. Because people want to do things, maybe with some husnuni, maybe with some good intention. But of course, good intention doesn't correct or rectify what is wrong, the action. If I've got a good intention, if that action is not sanctioned by Allah and His Messenger, then I don't do it. The fact that I've got a good intention is irrelevant. They have to go hand in hand. You have to have a good action, a correct, sanctioned action, and then of course you need a good intention. It's not about me having good intentions and me making up any action that I like. It doesn't work like this. So, it is important for us to also know, yes, what we should be doing, but be aware of what we shouldn't be doing. And realize as well, realize as well, the human side, the weak side, the ignorant side of why people are doing these things. You may know the sunnah, you know what you should be doing. However, you may be around people who don't know. And then they may start doing things or saying things which you know are contrary to our deen. So therefore, then you say to them, without any emotion, this is bid'ah. And every bid'ah is a dalala and every dalala is in the nar. It's a misguidance and every misguidance will take you to the fire. Yes, it's true, of course, the Prophet ﷺ told us that. But the manner it is taught, that you're educating that person is, is very important. So you need to understand at times, why is a person doing this? And we will mention some uh, examples later. That how the Prophet ﷺ, how he would deal with companions. Now there are tens of ahadith on lots of topics that we can go through. And I'm sure that we can, maybe in our own time, go away and read that. However, I would like to maybe just take not as many evidences because I'm sure we don't have the time to write them all. And I'll mention some books that maybe you can go back to if you want further evidences and further writings on the topic as well. That how the Prophet ﷺ, how he would interact with the companions and how he would, how we can understand and really see why was he khayru khalqil, why, why was he the best person that ever existed? Why was he the best man? Why was he the best of the anbiya? Why? Why? Because he, ﷺ, the way he would speak with people, the way he would interact with them, the words that he he said to them. And I, th- and I was just reading on, upon researching some of the issues here. I think to myself, somebody, and sometimes people come into my office and they ask me questions and they're in a difficult situation, and I think to myself, I don't know what to say. I really am lo- I'm a loss for words. I don't know what to say to you. I don't say that. It's going through my mind. And then maybe I end up, you know, um, and if you ever come to my office and you think he doesn't know what to say, <laughs> yeah, I'll end up just making dua for you because this is all I can think I can do for you. May Allah make it easy for you. May Allah give you patience. This is Allah's decree and Allah will only test you with things which are according to your, the level of your iman. I mean, that's the best I can say at times, most of the time, to be honest with you. But however, the Prophet, والسلام, the words that he chose, I think to myself, if I sat for a week, if I sat for a month, and I don't know how long I would have to sit 
to to think of something which would be good for that person. However, he, alayhi salatu salam, uh, the spur of a moment, a situation came to him. He and they just said those words, and the words were just situation changing completely. That the person who has just lost, maybe one of their a son, for example, we'll mention the hadith a little later. He lost his son. Just in a few seconds, a word was said to him, and you can feel and you can sense that the situation was changed 180 degrees, and that the person had a completely different view of how to experience the loss of a son. Just in one sentence. And it is these kind of uh, events, these type of hadith that we, we should be pondering over so that we can really have an understanding and feeling of what it means to, not, yes, to follow the sunnah, of course to follow the sunnah, but to understand it. Why am I doing it? To have a human side, to understand the human side of what it means to implement something in, in my life, my human life. This is also very important. So we will go through and mention some things like uh, the innovations that people do but to remember why are people doing that because they feel very vulnerable okay they feel very uneasy about what is going on and maybe they've inherited or are doing things that they've seen people do because maybe you do something you don't know what you're doing you know okay um, many, many years ago that before Jum'ah Okay, before Jum'ah, I'm in the masjid, the Imam gives the adhan, everybody stands up and prays to Raka'ah. Okay, let me stand up, let me pray to Raka'ah. Later on, I found out, why is everybody praying this to Raka'ah? Is there any uh, legislated sunnah after that adhan for everybody to do? No, not for Jum'ah, no. But why do we do it? Don't know. Maybe one person decided, and if you want to do a nafila for yourself, that's fine. But the way that everybody stood up, it was as though this was something sanctioned. And then I ended up seeing that, and I thought, okay, well, let me do that as well. So sometimes we find ourselves, I don't have any knowledge on that, or I'm not sure what I do. Then you look around and you see what other people are doing, and you think, okay, that looks kind of sunnah, that's salah, or that's dhikr, let me do it as well. And you end up doing it. And on the grand scheme of things, if it is said to you that you shouldn't do that right now, well, isn't it just ibadah? Isn't it dhikr? Isn't that sanctioned for us? We can't make dhikr? We can't worship Allah? Yes, you can, of course. But the point is that there are times when you're supposed to do things. And a very famous uh, example that can be given is Sa'id ibn Musayyib. Uh, rahimahullah that he saw a man praying after Fajr praying to Raka and he rebuked him for this is not a time to pray he said you're rebuking me for for praying to Raka he said I'm not rebuking for you rebuking you to pray for, for, for praying to Raka now but I'm rebuking you for going against the Sunnah because you're not supposed to do that right now and even a man who assumed Ihram a man who wanted to go into the state of Ihram from the grave of the Prophet ﷺ. Now technically, if you assume ihram from that place, is it a valid ihram or not? It's valid. It's valid. Because you've done it before you reach the miqat, the place that you're going to assume, which we, if you're in Medin, would be Dhul Hilayfa. You've done it before that. As long as you don't go past it on your way to Mecca and then assume it, then you're in violation of the, the places where you're assuming ihram. If you do it any time before that, it is okay. But a man was seen doing it from the grave of the Prophet ﷺ and he was rebuked. For, Why are you doing it here? If you really want to do something according to the sunnah, then do it from where the Prophet ﷺ would assume is ihram. So we're not necessarily looking at, although it's important the way they're doing it, but if they're doing the action correctly, but there may be the timing of it. The timing of that may be incorrect. So at times of difficulty, we're seeing things, what people are doing, not necessarily, I will just follow and then I will do that. And how big of a ni'mah and how big of a blessing it is that in any one particular situation that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given you, enabled you to have enough knowledge 
that you can perform that action correctly. It's a great ni'mah. It is a great ni'mah for you to go to Hajj, for any one person to perform one of the pillars of the deen. It's a great ni'mah. It is unfortunate that maybe that person with that ni'mah that Allah has given them, that they can go to Hajj, that they go to Hajj, but haven't got a clue how to do it. It is also a great ni'mah that when you go there, that you know what you're doing from one day to the next. And that you can perform your hajj as the Prophet said, that you'll take from me your rights of hajj. So it is a great ni'mah from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that you can perform or carry out and live how the Prophet and what the Prophet taught us to do at any one time. That's a great ni'mah. 